as she gave me this wonderful introduction, she did. Uh, my name's Jordan Dunn. Uh, I was a student here, I just graduated this past May. And like she said, as soon as I graduated, about, oh man, I don't know, five days afterwards, I hopped on a plane and I flew to uh, Nepal to begin working on this project. I was blessed to have been granted the Luma Scholarship probably, I think, what would have been like March, something like that, uh, before I graduated. So it was a big surprise. Uh, she kind of explained a little about what Lumos is. You know, really, it, it's about having an idea in mind where you're here, this is your present, and your future is here, and building a bridge between those two points of a future goal of what you want to do and the present of where you are now. And Lumo served as that bridge for me to kind of show me where I was going. Uh, if you notice, I have a couple things up here up front. Uh, you guys are welcome to come and look at these things. Um, I may reference them as we kind of go through the presentation. Um, and then also pay attention a little bit while we're going through. I'm gonna have a couple questions at the end. And if you get them right, you get a very small prize. But a nice prize, but a small prize. <laughs> so, um, now can anyone tell me where in the world Everest is? Does anyone know? Don't be shy. Yeah. Is it on the border of like Nepal and like China? Yeah, spot on. So Everest is right between Nepal and Tibet. Tibet is technically owned by China now. That's a whole different story, but uh, yes. So my focus for this project was on Nepal, and that's where the brunt of the impact of Mount Everest has been. And not just Mount Everest. When I say Everest, I use that as a proxy for the Himalayas, the mountains, because when we think Everest, that's the most well-known mountain that our mind pops to. Now, a little bit about Nepal. Uh, Nepal is a very interesting country. It's actually sandwiched, like I said, right between China and India, two huge superpowers. Um, you can kind of split it into three regions. This blue region is the Himalayas. The bottom is called the Terai. It's kind of a dry region. It looks a lot like India. And the middle is very hilly. Uh, still somewhat dry. Uh, towards the top, it gets very jungly. So we tend to only think mountains when we think Nepal, but it's also jungles and desert all sorts of geographical diversity. Um, it's been a kingdom for many, many years. It's always existed as a kingdom until around 1996, there was a communist uprising that shifted it from a kingdom uh, to a civil war. And then in 2008, they settled on a government that looks very similar to the UK. Uh, but even that government is plagued with a lot of uh, bribery, a lot of uh, corruption and they struggle with social, political, and economic problems still today. A lot of people long for the old monarchy because they loved the king that they had. Um, chief among the problems that Nepal faces is poverty. Uh, it is one of the poorest countries in the world. 25% uh, of the entire population in Nepal lives below the international poverty line. 30% uh, of the country's GDP, so 30% of its economy comes from remittances, which is essentially when people in Nepal move, a lot of them move to Dubai or Abu Dhabi, those kinds of cities, and they work and send money back home, which means they can't find work in their own country. Um, so one third of this whole economy comes from people working outside of the country. And then add to that, two thirds of the workers, of the jobs, are all in agriculture, which is strange because only one third of the economy's production comes from agriculture. So you have two thirds of people working producing only one third of the economic growth. Uh, now one industry in particular has impacted Nepal the most, and that is the mountaineering industry. Usually people who are able to make enough money, whether it's from farming, from agriculture, from mountaineering, tend to leave Nepal. Um, and it's not because they don't like their country, it's because there's no hope in their country. There's no economic growth or opportunity that exists there. Um, it's really difficult to climb any sort of ladder in Nepal and become successful, with the exception of working for the government. So we'll start with a little bit of the story of Everest. So in 1924, Everest started becoming a household name because of this man right here, George Mallory. This guy was the first guy to actually have the idea of climbing Everest. And it really hadn't been known as the world's tallest mountain until 18, around 1850. So this is pretty new. Uh, and picture in 1924, he tried to climb this mountain wearing a wool coat <coughs> and leather boots that had like nails drawn through them so they had traction on the ice. I mean, this guy was the real deal before we had the puffy jackets and everything that people wear now. Um, and, you know, mountaineering was a very, it was a fledgling sport. People hadn't really developed it much. Um, and people asked, why in the world would you want to climb this mountain? And George Mallory replied simply, because it's there. 
And that became the three most impactful words in the world of mountaineering. And I would argue the three most impactful words in the history of Nepal. So mountaineering began to grow. This spark of adventure caused people to wonder about the mountains, about Everest. Uh, and then an influx of climbers started to come after George Mallory into Nepal. People from Switzerland, from France, from Sweden. And it was kind of this race to summit Everest. Unfortunately, Mallory himself didn't make it. He ended up not coming home from Everest on his third attempt. Um, but this was never really a competition. So one of the leaders of a famous uh, expedition to Everest, he said that the opponent was not the parties, but it was Everest itself. People had this idea that it was a competition, but it wasn't. People were working together. Uh, Sir John Hunt also mentioned, he said, people passed the baton from one to the other. France passed it to Switzerland, Switzerland to England. And this book right here that I have up front is actually the book where this quote is from, The Conquest of Everest. So Everest became a force for good and growth. People started changing and growing. And finally, in 1953, was the first successful summit, thanks to two men that were part of Sir John Hunt's very own team. In 1953, they summited. It was Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. And a lot of people, when they came back from the summit, they asked, which of the two of you was actually the first one? Who actually was the first of the two of you to step foot on the mountain? And both of them refused to say. They said, we shared in both the successes and the failures. It was a team effort, and that's all that matters. Now, later it came out when Tenzing wrote his own autobiography that, in fact, Hillary did step on the summit first. But it didn't matter then. What mattered was working together. And that's what Everest was. It was bringing people together, and it started to bring Nepal together. <coughs> when they summited Everest, it was at 29,035 feet. Today, it's at 29,029 feet due to uh, both movement in the tectonic, tectonic plates as well as the uh, earthquake that we saw recently in Nepal. So this started to really shape Nepal. It gained international attention. People started flocking to the country and we saw a growth of tourism. By the 1990s, Nepal had a well-established um, formula for success. People started trekking, started hiking, started climbing sort of mountaineering, there's all sorts of things to do there. Now people go to the cities, people see the Buddhist monuments like this stupa right here. There's so much culture, diversity, and rich history inside the country of Nepal. And my, my goal was to study how Everest impacted this, and not just Everest, but tourism, how mountaineering impacted this country, both for good and for bad. See, to date, over 5,000 people have summited Everest. Um, so you can see a little bit how all these people flocking here caused tourism where they started selling, this is like just in a village in the, in the middle of the mountains, and they're selling North Face gear and mammoth gear. And you can see they have a comfort <laughs> inn in the middle of nowhere in Nepal. Um, this is a village called Namche Bazaar, and it is the largest of their villages. So like I said, 5,000 people have summited Paul's identity. The Sherpa is a very, very small group of people, and Everest is one mountain in one big country, but that's what most people think of when they think of Nepal. See, Nepal has so much diversity, so much more than just the Sherpa, just Everest, that most people don't know about. And Nepal itself capitalizes on this. I can tell you that nearly every small lodge is called the Sherpa Lodge. And even in places far, far away from where the Sherpa live or where Everest is, it's called the Sherpa Lodge. And you're like, well, there's no Sherpa here. How is this the Sherpa Lodge? But they know what they're doing. They're capitalizing on the success of this amazing group of people. But unfortunately, the story is not all good. See, the Sherpa, in some ways, have been exploited. And not necessarily on purpose, I don't think. But, you know, 1990 you saw the first non-military and non-climbing team groups of people. People who were just commercial, like you and me, that were paying to come to Nepal and climb the mountains. And what that opened the door to is people who had a lot of money but no experience. No, no uh, qualifications or reason to really be climbing Everest. And these Sherpa, they would be guiding them through the mountains, up to the peak, and that puts their life at risk when they're with someone who makes dumb decisions. A lot of people you know, they're halfway to the peak and the, a huge storm hits, a blizzard. And they say, I'm going anyway. Well, the Sherpa have to go with them. They can't abandon them. First of all, that would be a, an insult to their culture and their 
people. That's a big part of their uh, identity is their loyalty. And then two, they're getting paid by this guy. And so they follow people into dangerous conditions and end up risking their lives. On top of that, there's not a lot of other options. You see, every day they leave home, well not every day, but they leave home before every expedition, knowing there's a chance they may not come back. And the reason they do this is because they make money from it. And the only other option is be a poor farmer in Nepal. And most of them really choose both. They help mountaineer during the mountaineering season and they come home and they farm when the mountaineering season is off. So the Sherpa kind of face an economic trap. You know, they're stuck between working and farming and working and mountaineering or doing both. There's no other diversity there in terms of the economy. So I was really struck by the story and I had this idea, how can I help? How can I be part of making the Sherpa reach the potential that they have as people? So I started thinking, what organizations can I part with, partner with? Who's out there that's doing something like this already? And truth be told, there's really no one. There's lots of organizations that help with education, that have small schools there, but even those are not well funded and pretty remedial. And I started asking, why is no one doing this? The people, the Sherpa and the mountains that everyone loves and everyone holds so dear. People think of the Sherpa as being this hallmark of Nepal, but they're forgotten when it comes to actually helping them. So I had an idea. What if I combine my love for mountaineering with this service? What if I created a mountaineering organization, an international logistics organization that gives back to the community where these people live? If any of you are in business classes right now, you might call that a benefit corporation. And it's where you give a portion of your proceeds to help in some humanitarian way. So I started workshopping, how can I help? And this is a great example of a man who helped. This is a guy who was a Sherpa. Uh, his, uh, one thing that you guys should all know, everyone who is in Nepal is of a different ethnic group. And your ethnic group is your last name. So everyone who is a Sherpa, their last name is Sherpa. So this is Pasang Lama Sherpa. Um, now Pasang, he was a guy in the mountains, but then obviously he aged to a point where he could no longer do his work. So he dedicated his life to taking care of the trail that led to Everest Base Camp. He spent all of his time pretty much tending the trail, keeping trash off the trail, making sure that it was developed well. And he got to an age now that he's really old, he can't even do that. So he stands at a certain portion of the trail and collects donations from people who are hiking along the trail. And a lot of people donate. <laughs> it is uh, fantastic to see what this man and what the group of people he work, works with have done to the trail to keep it up and to keep it beautiful and clean. So I wanted to focus on these areas in terms of helping Nepal. Focusing on education, healthcare, economics, and conservation. It's been shown through multiple studies, and in fact, I did a research study, I was an economics student before I graduated, that showed the vast majority of economic growth is powered by the impact of education and healthcare. Those two things push the way an economy can function. In fact, if you had to dial it down even further, it's early childhood education and healthcare that impacts the economy the most. My question was, how do I do that for Nepal? But I'd never been to Nepal. I knew nothing about the country, and that's where Lumos came in, becoming my bridge between where I am now and the future that I want to see. So I needed to learn. I needed to see this for myself. My goals in doing this was simply to understand the culture and society of Nepal. See it for myself. Stop just reading about it in books, in articles, but see it. Witness the mountaineer, mountaineer industry, both the good and the bad. And finally, to learn about these four focus areas in Nepal. What is healthcare, economics, conservation, the environment? What is all of this like inside Nepal itself? So I structured my trip in a very particular way with the help of Lumos. They actually really helped me by suggesting this last piece that ended up being a huge piece of the puzzle. My first two weeks, I simply trekked from village to village up to Everest Base Camp. And that allowed me an opportunity to talk with people who work in the mountaineering and tourism industry, to talk with different ethnic groups throughout the villages, and to learn about this. And this was in the Everest, or what's called the Kumbu region. Kumbu is a glacier that pretty much covers and dominates the region. It's where most of the water sources are coming from. So it's called the Kumbu region. The next five weeks, I spent doing something a little bit slower. I lived in a small village, far away from where I was in Everest. It was far in uh, 
West Nepal, and I worked in a small team of international people in conservation. Uh, and that was a village called Gandruk in a different region called Annapurna, which was also mountains, but it was a little more jungly than it was alpine, like we think of Everest. And then my last two weeks were spent in the city of Kathmandu, the capital city, getting a chance to observe their healthcare practices and see how the medical work was done in Nepal. So I got to cover the understanding culture, I got to understand how conservation works, and I got to understand how um, healthcare worked. And amongst all of this, I got to talk to people about education and about economics and about opportunity along the way. So this structure really helped me get a chance and a feel to see what Nepal is actually like. So the first part, base camp. I flew immediately after I graduated. I flew into Nepal, I think it was probably three days after uh, I finished um, a small conference with two guys over here uh, called RUF. If you guys aren't RUF, it's a great organization here on campus. Graduated, went to RUF, flew like the day after. Um, and I spent this time essentially working with a team of people from all over the world. There are people from the United States, a lot of people from England, uh, people from New Zealand, from Australia, all over. And we were hiking to base camp. Every day we woke up, we hiked. And we talked to people along the way. I met in Kathmandu, where we landed, I met this man. This is Ram Mokhtan. Mokhtan is his uh, ethnic group. And he's from a very different region than, uh, than uh, the Himalayas in Nepal. He's actually towards the border with India. But Ram was one of the wisest people I'd ever met. He was only in his 50s, but he'd been doing this his whole life. He'd been guiding people on Everest base camp treks. He's never been up Everest. See, there's a big difference between base camp and the peak of Everest. He's never been up the mountain, but he's been going to and from the base camp his whole life, and he knows everyone there. And this man was the key to a lot of the knowledge and a lot of the contacts that I was able to make in Nepal. From there, we took a four-hour bus ride across Nepal that allowed me to see it's not all mountains. A lot of it's very jungly, deserty, dirt. Uh, very scary roads, as you can see. Uh, a lot of points where we weren't sure we were going to make it to Everest Base Camp or home. Um, and you can really see the diversity that it has. I mean, this looks nothing like what you picture when you picture Everest. This is completely different. It looks a little bit more like India. Uh, from there, we boarded a plane, a uh, very tiny 15-seater plane, smallest plane I'd been on at that point. And we flew uh, over the mountains uh, and into this tiny town called Lukla. Uh, and this is actually the world's most dangerous airport is what they're known for. You see, this is the end of the runway here. That's a cliff. There's nothing past that point right there. And on this side, where you can't see in the photo, is the face of a mountain. So when you're flying in, the pilot has to, at the point that he's going to land, dedicate himself to landing. Because if he can't land, he doesn't have enough room to pull up. He's going to hit the mountain. And if he takes off, he has to dedicate himself to taking off. Because if he doesn't, he's going off that cliff. So it's pretty much a 50-50 <laughs> shot either way. Now the good thing is, the pilots there are really good. Really experienced Nepali pilots. I mean, they, they do this every single day. They cancel it if there's like three clouds in the sky, they're like, no more planes. So they're very, very particular. And I believe in the last five years, there's been maybe one crash. So that bodes well, considering they have like maybe five or six flights per day going all year long. Um, now, we met our assistant guides here. Oh, well, first I'll say, this is where Lukla is. This gives you an idea on the map. So Lukla is up here by Everest. I flew in to Kathmandu here, and then took that small bus to a tiny town around here, and then flew from here to there. So this is where I started my journey in Lukla. Then I worked in Gandruk, which is we'll come back to in Kathmandu. So, it was hours of transportation between those points, even though it really wasn't that far because of the roads there. Um, but that said, we went village to village. We got to meet our assistant guides. This is Surya. He's only 25. Um, he'd been working in the industry since he was probably 18. Um, started as a porter and had graduated to assistant guide. Uh, and this is Biru, who we affectionately called the Biru. See, Biru led us throughout the entire thing. He was always in front of the line. His bright orange backpack was our mark of who to follow. And Biru he didn't speak as good of English as Surya or Ram, but he was such a loving, nice guy. He's very quiet, but as he opened up, you learned he farmed with his family whenever he wasn't guiding. Um, 
and he'd grown up just like Surya as a porter and transferred to assistant guide. So we started our trek with these guys. We trekked from village to village. This is a large village called Namshi Bazaar, as I mentioned earlier. We stayed in these tiny little houses called tea houses, kind of like a little motel. Um, and they were very modest rooms, such as this. And a lot of the tea houses were owned by people who had been successful in the tourism industry as porters or guides that had made enough money to open their own house. Now the entire economy of this whole region rested on uh, paths, people walking on foot. Most people transported things by horse, or this is actually quite rare that I saw a horse. More commonly, yak. There are yaks everywhere in Nepal. And that's how they get anything, anywhere. There's no roads connecting this place. Hundreds of miles of stretch with no roads that most people walk on foot or transport by yak, which is why you don't really want to eat the meat up there because it's been on the back of a yak for two weeks. So, but it's really interesting seeing how they're able to be uh, a functioning economy. They're able to have a FedEx, if you will, on the back of yaks and horses. But more importantly, their economy rests on porters. Now, porters are essentially what most people confuse Sherpa for. Sherpa is an ethnic group. Porter is a job. Porters carry things for people. It can be anywhere from commercial uh, businesses that they're carrying things for people who live in the mountains, or it can be mountaineers that they're carrying stuff for. This guy is obviously carrying, uh, it looks like water. He's carrying water up. They keep it in boxes like that to uh, a higher altitude place. He's, they usually start in Lukla, that's where this is, and they hike as far as, as ever space camp and back, which can be uh, over 100 miles, about 110 miles to do that trip. So this is a very difficult job, and they pretty much uh, are the backbone of what keeps the economy going. I mean, if it's not on the back of a yak, then it's on the back of a porter. So they make about 60 cents per kilogram per day of what they carry. Now, I know we don't really think kilograms, but um, that's probably about uh, 1.5, I think, kilograms is pounds. I think that's right. So it's like 100 pounds, something like that. I'm not, I'm not for sure, actually. But what they do is they usually do like a trip a week. So a trip can last two days. They can make about $93 from one trip in a week but it's a seasonal job. They usually work only six months out of the year. So they'll roughly make $3,000 a year. Now these, this is kind of their uh, methodology. They often have wicker baskets that they carry items in and they have this rope that actually attaches uh, to a headband that goes around their forehead. They don't carry it like a backpack. And this looks really painful, but they've been doing this for a long time and it distributes the weight down their back actually. Now, you go from a porter, that's where you start in this industry, and you graduate to a, a uh, guide, and you start guiding people, or assistant guide, really, and you go from assistant guide to guide, and if you're really successful, you either open a tea house, or you become a leader for mountaineering. And in mountaineering, there's a big disparity in pay. You see, people who are from Nepal that guide to Everest, or really any mountain, get about $5,000 per expedition. But Western guides get about $50,000. It's 10 times more. And that's simply because they can take less, but they have very high standards of living. See, because they've carried all their goods and services by yak up to these high elevation places, uh, very small things are very expensive. So like for me, like a, I bought like a can of orange juice and that was $10 or uh, some crackers were six or $7. Everything was really expensive because of having to transport them across uh, the city, and there was no place, excuse me, across the region, there's no place that was more evident of this problem than Fortse. Fortse was a very, very small village off the path of, to Everest that was 100% Sherpa, and it was abandoned. There was no one there. And there was one reason why it was abandoned. Everest. Because it was May, and May is peak time for Everest. And this tiny village had no one there because everyone was on Everest guiding. The only people there were monks working in the monastery and small families of young women, children, and older men. And the children were out, they were celebrating Buddha's birthday. Um, it's a holiday in the Buddhist faith. And I could not get a picture of the front of a monk's face. Uh, they often will kind of like run away from you, but um, they were very, very nice people that are dedicated to serving their community. And this is the, uh, the most informative group of people 
two people that I met. These two people are Sherpa. And there were the few Sherpa that were around. This man summited Everest three times. And he was one of the few people that I talked to that loved his job. He couldn't picture himself doing anything else. He was proud of just having summited Everest three times and loved what he did. Versus other people, like the man who owned the tea house where I worked. He was summoning Everest for the 10th time in his career. And it boiled down to, that's the only thing I can do. That's how I make money. But if I had an opportunity, I would do something else. And I even asked our assistant guides, asked Surya and Biru, what would you do if you could do anything? And they didn't understand the question. They were like, what does that mean? Do anything, what do you mean? And I was like, if you could have a job that's not what you have now, that's any job you want, what would it be? And finally, they said, oh, well, I think I'm going to be a teacher. And I thought, why can't they be a teacher? I mean, that just stinks that they have to choose between farming and guiding in the mountains instead of doing what they might otherwise be good at or want to do. In fact, there was only one person that I've heard a story about in all of the region who everyone was proud of because he had somehow managed to get a scholarship to Harvard. And he came here to study, uh, I don't know what he studied, and I never really heard about that, but they were all excited because one person from the Kumba region came to the United States to study. But most people work their way up through the mountaineering industry, make enough money, and they move to the US. That's what Tenzing did, that's what, um, the person who holds the record, the Sherpa who holds the record for summoning Everest the most times, which is 25 times, that's a lot of times. He lives in uh, Utah now. I actually spoke with him on the phone before I left. And most people like that, they just wanna leave. So there's a lot of danger, and this, this is a great example of this danger. This is a monument covered with prayer flags. And prayer flags, the belief is they, they write prayers on them. And when the wind blows them, the idea is that they blow the prayers over the region. And this is a monument to a group of people who died in the 1996 Everest disaster when people were climbing Everest and they were hit by a sudden blizzard. And they ended up having one of the largest death tolls. 12 people died on Everest that year, which is high for Everest. You have probably around three, 300 to 350 people attempting Everest every year. And about, about three to 5% people die in that attempt, which is low, lower than you might think. There's another mountain called Annapurna. 30% of people die attempting Annapurna. But still, it's a very dangerous job. And this monument was to the Sherpa and those men who lost their lives during that Everest disaster. But we finally made it to Everest Base Camp. This is my team. Um, again, people from all over the world, people from Australia, excuse me, Australia, the UK, um, just you name it, a lot of different countries, and allowed me to really understand where they were coming from and why they were there. And here's me with, with my favorite person on the track, Ram. He probably got annoyed by how many questions I asked him <laughs> along the way, but it was worth it. And this is uh, this mountain behind me is called Pomori. It was actually named by George Mallory, the guy I mentioned earlier. Uh, Pomori means uh, mountain daughter, and he named it uh, in honor of his own daughter. So. The next part of my trip was to Annapurna. This is when I started doing conservation. So I jumped over, I took a plane from Lukla to Kathmandu, and then a bus for nine hours, that was horrible, from Kathmandu to Gandra. And that distance is probably the same distance of driving from here to like, oh boy, uh, Atlanta? So like a three hour drive. But it took nine hours because of the roads in Nepal and the traffic in Nepal. So that was exciting. Uh, but anyway, I lived in this very small, pleasant village called Gandra. And we lived essentially in a tea house, but it was set up for this organization I work for, so that we could uh, do our work every day and come home and have food together and live together. And this is my team. Again, a team from all over the world. Uh, this, our guy on the far right was our leader. His name's Prahesh. Uh, and his, the guy to his right, sorry, the far left, and the guy to his right is um, basically the manager of the whole place. Um, so we have people, again, from France, from uh, Germany, from the UK, from Sri Lanka, I mean, anywhere. Um, and it was great getting to experience these people. My favorite partners of all of the, the whole trip I was there were these two people, uh, these two very, very important workers. Uh, one was named Seti, um, and the other one uh, was named Kalu. And Seti means white, as you can see, and Kalu means black. And they were very opposite personalities. This guy fought every 
dog in the entire village and said he was just a sweet uh, little buddy that you could pet when you got back. But we worked for the Annapurna Conservation Area, and that's what this region is called. And every day we woke up and we did different jobs to collect data and to send it to the Annapurna offices so that they could understand how changes in species migration, how changes in the environment was impacting the region or how things in the region were impacting it. So it was essentially a micro view of what it looks like when you study things like climate change or things like um, environmental impact. Uh, so we did surveys of different animals, we collected data, we would hike deep into the jungle and set up these cameras to capture videos of leopards or bears or anything, you name it, and we would even do waste cleanup with people in the village. And this is kind of an idea, it's a very different landscape, it's very jungly and uh, kind of looked like something from uh, the Jungle Book at some points. Uh, we would spend time, we would measure like pH balance of water and try to understand what is happening in the environment here. And it gave me a lot of experience to see how the environment uh, plays a role in the actual tourism they're bringing in. Because if it wasn't beautiful like it is, then people would come there. But the inverse of that is as people come there, in some ways it makes it less beautiful because they hurt the region. Uh, this is a great example. We walked around all day, every day, looking at this book, trying to figure out what species of birds we were looking at all the time. And one of the biggest things that I learned is a challenge Nepal faces, uh, especially in its rural areas, is the building of new roads. That people are averse to, to roads, even though they need them to connect the, the country, they're afraid that it's going to destroy tourism. And if it destroys tourism, it destroys their living. So there is this negative idea that roads will hurt our jobs. But the truth is that roads, while it will temporarily hurt their jobs, will help the economy, it will connect the people, and it will help diversify the jobs. See, if you only rest on tourism for the history of Nepal, then these people will continue in this trap, the same trap the Sherpa are in. But as they become more connected, there can be more economic diversity. The next thing I learned about was education. Uh, a lot of the children there uh, while they spend a lot of time in school, when they're not in school, their parents aren't much with them. They're just kind of wandering in the villages and they kind of grow up themselves in a lot of ways because their parents are so busy farming and working. As soon as they're of age, they start working. You know, uh, Biru started working when he was 15 as a guy. And the education system there too is not uh, focused on learning as much as it is on discipline. A lot of it is around children misbehaving and they hit children with sticks when they misbehave. So you have a kid that doesn't do his homework, he gets hit with a stick, and he starts crying, and he doesn't learn anything that day because he spends the whole day crying and sad. And some of my good friends worked in education before they came to this conservation project, and they said it was really difficult to do this because I, they didn't want to hit people with sticks, but they had to watch other Nepali teachers hit people with sticks and, and get on to these kids, and they're like, they're not learning anything. You know, where's the actual education here? Um, and two, most of the teachers, they're your age. They're like 19, 20, 21 year old kids in Nepal that don't really know what they're doing nor are they qualified to be teaching. So it's a very difficult imbalance there with education to make sure these kids really are learning, not just that there are more schools with more kids in them. So one of the biggest things I noticed was Nepal's economic potential. Their biggest potential was in power. So a lot of Nepal has electricity from hydropower, but Nepal is capable of so much more. They've only tapped into 400 megawatts of hydropower of 50,000 potential megawatts that they can tap into. And 50,000 is just a number, it's like, what's a megawatt? But to give you an idea, they could power most of China and India if they tapped into their full potential. But they would never do that because Nepal's government is very, um, if you will, held to China and India's uh, whims. They don't want to step on their toes because they're a small country. So China and India obviously don't want to be reliant on Nepal for energy. So Nepal never really develops this potential. And then my last section of this trip was spent in Kathmandu. This was completely different from anything else I had experienced um, or expected to experience. So Kathmandu, as I showed before, is right here on the map. This is the capital of the country. Uh, it has the most people living in it of the country, the most populous city. Um, and it was also one of the most polluted cities in the entire world. Uh, and this is for a lot of reasons. One, they have all kinds of new construction, but they don't use any construction standards like we do. So there's dust flying up everywhere. Two, it's just dusty in general. 
three, there's no emission standards. So the cars there have horrible emissions going on. And this picture really doesn't even do it justice, but it was just like a gray fog anywhere you went. The only thing that cleared that was when it would rain. I had to wear a mask a lot of the time that I was there because otherwise I just coughed uncontrollably. And one of the reasons this happens is because people in Nepal really don't have much of a sense of uh, hygiene, of taking care of things and be being clean. Um, and this is a good example of it. This is a, a very uh, beautiful temple is on the other side of this photo called Pashupati. But this is a, an area where they actually, uh, the Hindu people actually burn their dead. And it's kind of a ceremonial, ceremonious practice. And uh, they kind of make it into a religious, um, really like a big event for the family to come to. And, and it's, it's kind of like um, a holy thing being burned. And the only issue with this is that they put the remains in the river. And the UN has worked with them to say, hey, can you please just not put the remains in the river? And for them, that's part of the ceremony. And they say no. Well, not far down from this point, people bathe in this river and people drink water from this river. And that in a lot of ways leads to the sickness that people have. And there's this big sensitive balance between understanding the culture of the people and understanding the needs of Nepal. So that's something that Nepal is still navigating right now. Another thing is the open markets. Um, a lot of the food comes from meat or from plants that are just sitting out in the open and flies land on them. There's all sorts of things. I got sick at least three times from the food in Nepal. Um, and it was difficult to know, okay, is this restaurant sanitary? Is it not sanitary? Um, and you can just look at the roads. I mean, this is a cool man I saw riding his bike. I don't know who he is, but you can look at how muddy and dirty it is. I mean, there's hardly a spot of green across all of, the, uh, all of Kathmandu. And that's a big reason why there's so much pollution because there's no um, plants to absorb the pollution that is in the air. That's the big important thing about having green spaces in cities like um, Centennial Park here, or Central Park in New York, that it absorbs the carbon in the atmosphere. This is where I live. It wasn't you know much to look at, uh, but this is really what a lot of the buildings look like in Nepal. You know, the nicer buildings are more or ornate, painted, but um, a lot of these buildings across Kathmandu are very simplistic concrete structures. But you have also this contrast with deeply uh, historical and religious monuments. Like, this is the other side of Pashupati, the temple. And it is a UN uh, World Heritage Site. It's one of the oldest temples in the entire world. And it was an incredible opportunity just to see this place. But I worked during this time in a hospital. Um, now, obviously, I'm not qualified to do any work. I didn't do medical work. My job was observation and essentially interviewing doctors and gather information. I worked with a team of people, people from all over. Um, this guy in the front that's doing, I don't know what he's doing, like thumbs up, but his name is Yang. He was from Nepal originally, but his parents are another story of people who made enough money and they left. They went to the UK. He grew up his whole life in the UK. Uh, that's the same with this girl in the front. Her name was Tijasui, and Tijasui, her family were ambassadors in Nepal, and they left, and uh, she grew up in New York City. So a lot of people do this same pattern in Nepal. And then the other people, the UK, uh, she was from Hong Kong, so people all over, some of them wanting to work in the medical field, and some of them just wanting to understand Nepal, like me. We worked in a small hospital um, and got to witness really how bad their sanitation is, that they reuse catheters for people. Uh, they don't sanitize things well, uh, like needles or tools. Really all they do is they throw it in a pot of formaldehyde for like five minutes, then wash it off and then reuse it. And if you know anything about how we do sanitation here, it is a long process to sanitize medical tools, not five minutes in a pot of formaldehyde. So there's a lot of problems that Nepal's facing in terms of this, and two, the people are very shy in Nepal. They're afraid to talk about their healthcare problems. Men are afraid to take their shirt off to be looked at for dermatology. It's an interesting culture of people who are very low key, very shy, and very um, self-reserved. So all of these experiences put together, spending time in the Himalayas, spending time in conservation, spending time witnessing healthcare. I even got to witness a C-section. Um, and I will say in Nepal, because of their poor, um, because of their, I'm trying to think how to explain this, they don't have enough resources to do births 
uh, naturally. So usually they overdo C-sections. So if a woman uh, is, I don't know, five minutes late on having birth, they'll do a C-section. And it's pretty much every single day, there's like four or five C-sections a day. And I got to witness one of these C-sections, which was really cool. They do it actually up to good standards uh, from what I saw, but they overdo it. And so a lot of women are receiving C-sections that really don't need it. And this kind of goes back to uh, the focus on women's health and early childhood development that Nepal really hasn't mastered yet. Um, and it's, it's not that they don't have the people to do it. You see, Nepal's people are very intelligent. They don't have the school infrastructure is the problem. See, a lot of people want to become doctors in Nepal. It's actually really cool how many people are interested in it. But they only have this many seats for their medical school, and they have this many people that want to be in a medical field. So a lot of people in Nepal either have to give up on their dream of being a doctor or go to a different country if they have enough money. A lot of the doctors I spoke with, they had traveled to different countries to get their degree. So Nepal doesn't have the infrastructure yet to support the medical field that it needs to. So all of this combined together taught me a lot. It taught me the need for economic diversification, diversification, the need for healthcare, education, sanitation, and most of all, jumping back down, the need for education reform, the need for opportunities so people could learn to work in healthcare or to learn, work in uh, environmental sustainability, and most of all for infrastructure so people could be connected across this country and they could grow. And bringing this back to Everest, the mountains have brought a lot of growth to Nepal but now the country is too reliant on them for tourism, for their money. They think if we leave it be and just let people come, we will grow. But they need an active approach of environmental sustainability, of education, and most of all, of bringing the country together to work for a greater end rather than waiting for people to come to it to help it work uh, to a new beginning. Uh, most of all, it must really focus on pioneering both its education and its healthcare, as I said before, so that the, the students there and the medical professionals there can allow the economy to grow, because that's where it starts. And for me, my hope is to take all of this and work over the next few years to make a big impact uh, in the future and to pull together this organization to contribute to Nepal in a bigger and better way. And maybe more people can join me in that journey because I can't do it alone. But now I'm back home um, and trying to navigate where to go from here. So that is my trip to Nepal and that is Dark Side of Everest.